This session is organized by the Organizations Hub of Systems Innovation Network, and I will pass it on to John. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Anya, for that intro. Um, so I thought it'd be a great idea to have a session like this because this is going to be much more about the practice of how do we learn in an organization? How do we develop a learning organization? How do we work with the teams and managers so that instead of just sitting and waiting for instructions, um, we actually do other things, whatever those other things are. So that's what I'm wanting to talk about. So the design of today is probably going to last about an hour. And um, the idea is that I will be talking for the first part, I don't know how long that'll be, about one particular organization, but also about other examples as well, but mainly one organization, because it's usually helpful to get an understanding of what they've done and why they do things like that. The this isn't going to be a presentation. This is just going to be about this is what I know about this organization. If there's anything that you don't understand about what I'm saying, if you can't hear, there's a couple of videos. If you can't hear something very well, just unmute yourself and shout at me, please, because it's very difficult for me to look at the chat. And if Anya looks at the chat, she'll only unmute herself and shout at me anyway. So <laughs> please feel free to say if you can't understand because that that's not helpful to you right anything anything anyone wants to say before we start you're in the right place okay good so and this is this is a topic that i've found really interesting and i've been thinking about for a long time when i was working in organizations when i was younger how do you develop a learning organization I'm going to go into there. So hopefully you just see one screen and not my notes. So actually perhaps the more interesting questions are why are we not learning organizations rather than talking about learning organizations? So we're gonna we're gonna have both of those questions. I think this is the more important question. You're probably familiar with this because this is kind of one of the standard places people go to. It's a book about learning organizations, the art and practice of learning organizations. Now, this was published in the 1990s. And it has sold over 2 million copies. But the question is, why are we not all becoming learning organizations now? That's the question people have. And in fact, this is one of the frustrations of people like Peter Senge, why hasn't the world changed? Um, so we're going to talk about that. And, and I'm going to use a particular organization. But before I go into that organization, can I ask you to write down in the chat, the top two or three organizations that you know, are particularly good at learning. So if, if we would want to go to a learning organization now and look at them, which one would it be? So if you could add that into the chat and I just want to see what people have, what people write down. A small startup. Okay. That's interesting. Yep. Okay. Okay. Good. Ty. So no large ones, no sort of popular ones that other people might sort of put down, write down. Sometimes you ask this question and people go, OK, that's interesting. Um, people go, oh, Amazon or Google or something like that. So um, the one that I'm going to bring up is one from a while ago, actually. So. This is how they used to make cars. And in fact, some organizations still make cars. By the way, this is nothing about manufacturing, so don't worry about that. Um, and what happened is that in the 1970s, 
there was something called the oil crisis and that meant that the price of oil went skyrocketing up in fact oil became difficult to get hold of and what happened was that all the car companies lost money quite disastrously except one and that one was toyota and they couldn't figure out oh hang on a minute why is toyota still making a profit so a bunch of executives from ford went over there to find out so what i'm going to talk about now is the journey that took took people from uh where they were to a learning organization in the early part of the last century a guy surnamed toyota was an inventor and he developed um, weaving machines in fact he was so successful at developing weaving machines in japan that he exported them to the us and they were actually the key machines that were used to make Levi jeans, for example, and lots of other textiles in the United States. Highly successful, uh, very efficient, very effective, very reliable. And he, he ran a large manufacturing organization in Japan. And for some reason, he woke up one day and thought, you know what, I've always wanted to make cars. So I'm going to make cars. So this was around the Second World War. He decided to make cars instead of um, textile machines, weaving machines. And he didn't have any experience of making cars. So what do you what would you do if your organization that you worked in suddenly said, hello, we're now going to make this totally different type of product? Any ideas? What would you do? Any thoughts? There was no Internet in those days. <laughs> By the way, it's interesting that some of you can't think of any learning organizations to put up. That's really fascinating. But what would you do? Now, that's not an easy question. So I'm not expecting I'm not expecting people to sort of come up with any enlightened answers. What they did is they decided to go to the most famous car manufacturer in the world and learn how to make cars. So Toyota and his chief engineer went over to the United States. This was just after the Second World War. They couldn't really speak English. Uh, they went to the Ford plants in the United States. They went more than once to visit the United States. And they came back and they go, wow, that was really interesting. But we haven't got any money. <clears throat> We're not very big. We still want to make cars. How are we going to do that? Um, and they came back and they decided to do it all themselves. So what uh, the chief engineer did, which he was called Taichi Ono, he decided to get his engineers together and figure out how to make cars and how to make them better. Now this process, now when I say how to make them better, what I, what I mean is that if you went to Ford at this time, they had huge big machines and to change one machine over, so that they would make one type of car for several days and then they would stop the machines and they would change the machines, change the dies in the machines so that they could make a different model of car. And then they would make lots and that would take about a day, maybe even some cases longer to change the equipment around. And then they made lots of those types of cars and then they would fill up these fields with all these different types of cars and then they would sell them or try and sell them. What uh, Taichi Ono tried to do was go, well, that wasn't very efficient. What I want to do is to try and make different types of cars very quickly. So they worked on how to change those machines over very quickly. They tried to reduce the amount of parts and things that were around in the factory because they were costing money. Um, and the way that Taichi Ono did this was by engaging those engineers and working together with them. So after about 20 years, 30 years, when the oil crisis hit, suddenly Toyota were making a profit and no one else was. So when the executives from Ford, they, they jumped in a plane and they went over to Toyota and had a visit. 
and they said, oh, this is interesting. You're doing all these different things. Um, one of the things they were doing is they were making different models on the production line, like all at the same time. Strange. They didn't have any work in progress. They didn't have any quality control. Um, and they had the suppliers were supplying them very, very, very closely. They were working together with suppliers. And one more thing, the managers were wearing overalls. So these are the things they did. They saw, they went back to the US and they said, right, this is, we're going to change all this. You're going to, your manager's going to wear overalls. Um, you're going to get rid of the quality inspections at the end of the end of the line, because we don't want that. It costs us. And they did that. And it was a big disaster. Costs went up. Quality went down. <laughs> and they go, right, that didn't work, did it? No. So what did Toyota do? Um, and this is what we're now going to be talking about. So what I'm what I've got instead of me talking, I want to help by demonstrating other people and what they're saying, because I find this really fascinating. So this is uh, something from someone called Mr. Yoshino, who worked for Toyota. And this is what happened to him when he first joined. So let me get there, please. Uh, right. If anyone cannot hear this properly, the person is talking, he's Japanese and he's talking in English. His English is not great. But if someone has a problem with the volume or quality or something like that, then just and shout. So my story is, is that it, about the my uh, experience working in that uh, plant because you know I was assigned to Motomachi plant where we the people are manufacturing small size car like Corona oh no not Corona <laughs> virus but the Corona by right. the way anyway so um, that was the manufacturing plant and I was sent to the paint shop but it's not the, that I was uh, painting the the car body, but I was in. I was sent to the uh, preparation uh, office, not office, uh, a storage where we have some paint cans uh, and we keep it and we put it in the tank and uh, then and the paint paint is uh, is brought into the painting shop. So we have to prepare all those painting. So my job is was to put the paint. Uh, in the tank, also the solvent. We at the time we have to uh, put in uh, two different uh, 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 materials. One is paint itself, and another one is solvent. So we have to put into together. So I, my job is every two or three hours when the tank is 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 empty, then I my job is to put the paint A to the tank mixer, then solvent A. Uh, the same material solvent A to the tank and then put the, push the button. Then the, the machine just mix it up and then send it through the pipe to the painting shop. That's my job. Then maybe two or three hours later, then it get empty. So I have to do the same thing. And one day, when I just I finish, I finish my my work, then I just waiting and and uh, taking a look at the document or something. Then. You know, all of a sudden, these people in the painting shops rush to our, you know, storage, mm -hmm. and ask me, okay, oh, okay, you guys, something is wrong in the painting shop because paint does not stick to the bottle panel, something is wrong. So then the people came in, and uh, I was new, very new, maybe the first one week or so, very, very new. So I was so surprised. Okay, something is wrong. I must have done something wrong. So just people can ask me, oh, okay, what did you do that? Okay, yes, sir. I just put this salt and uh, paint A in the tank. Then I I put the solvent A to the tank. Then I take a close look at the at the label. <laughs> it was it was solvent B. No, no. Is, I am not supposed to put that different one, but I did it. I did not notice that. So maybe a couple of hours later it came out. So we found out that I put the wrong solvent in the tank which creates huge problem one more than 100 cars should be repainted so i was so shocked but you know what what happened next is that okay so what happened next this is the question any ideas what would happen in the organizations that you're familiar with so this is a person that's been working there one week he's made a terrible mistake 
100 cars need to be repainted because of a mistake he made. What would happen in organizations that you know? Just unmute yourselves, please. And, and, and yeah. Chu wrote, blame the person. Okay. And uh, Judith wrote, put a clearer label on it. Do you want okay. to explain that, Judith? But what would happen to Mr. Yoshino? I think it would be a whole disciplinary process that might need to happen or something along some organizational lines, but a, a whole process of something to him with him. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Lavinia. And someone, Andrea, you put go to work to another place. <laughs> yeah. yeah, very good. Okay. What we're going to do now is hear the rest of the video uh, as to what happens next. And this is key to becoming a learning organization, perhaps. So let's go to. Then I ex explained that. Then the big boss, the boss of my, my storage store, is that he said, okay, so you pick up the wrong one, but without noticing that we pick up the wrong ones. So it's not necessarily your mistake. It's our mistake because we did not you know, give you all the detailed instruction, but we just let you do that yourself. So it was my, it was our mistake, but don't worry that we have to figure out how to stop the, the same thing from happening again. Ah, yeah. So nobody ever blame me. So I was so shocked that it makes me feel so happy. Okay, these guys did not start blaming me, but they want to just find the real cause of the problem. Of course, the paint, Paint manager also came in. So all of the people looking at the same problem, I mean, look at the problem and the, you know, thinking of the same way, how to solve the problem. So I was so happy. And uh, after that, of course, my, my boss and group leaders just try to uh, um, segregate in the area of how, where to store the paint A and paint B. So. Uh, they learn some lessons out of my mis big mistake. Yeah. And uh, so that was really, really big mistake for me because at the time what I thought is that, okay, what kind of people are these people? Because usually, you know, they, gonna, they can easily blame me for the big mistake, but they didn't. Mm -hmm. So what is the thinking behind this? It's because they want to solve the problem because we are not perfect. So we make right. mistakes. Mistakes happen everywhere, particularly the newcomer like me. So uh, that is what happened to me. And uh, after that experience, you know, um, I just, uh, then I ex Okay, so, um, so any thoughts? Uh, from anyone about that? I think you can just unmute yourselves and, and uh, or, or put something in the chat, whichever you whichever you feel more comfortable. What, what, what are your thoughts about that, Judith? For me, to me, it's very interesting because um, what I've learned so far, at least from China and from South um, East Asian countries, that it's very, very hard to live with an arrow and um, that it's yeah very hard for that person, in this case, this uh, Ichao, and um, that, yeah, to admit that he's done um, a failure. But maybe, I don't know, it's different in Japan. And uh, maybe it's maybe also out of this culture, they're trying to kind of distribute the error and saying like, oh, oh, it's not your fault. So his face is to say he won't lose his face. Um, but everyone takes the responsibility or the organization and the manager says, okay, it's our fault. Okay. Thank you, Judith. Any more comments from anyone? Uh, I'm very interested in the fact that how immediately ev that everybody started feeling accountable about it. And there was a shared responsibility amongst the platform, which usually doesn't happen in these large organizations with the kind of hierarchy they have. So very interesting. Okay. 
I think I might also add that it's interesting when um, people end up admitting that it was their mistake because often in organizations, um, especially amongst the whole team, um, sometimes even if it was, even if someone initiated a mistake, they would not necessarily verbalize it, but let it, let the mistake kind of expand into a larger um, mistake with without even um, telling anyone that it was bound to happen. So mistakes can also kind of become larger and larger once it's not communicated immediately. And often people don't feel like they can communicate their own mistakes within organizations um, immediately, especially in, in, well, in the blame culture organizations um, that foster this kind of blame culture. Um, yeah, so it's it's also an interesting step to actually verbalize that one, one has done a certain error um, and why someone should, wouldn't want to communicate that in the first place as well. Thank you, Anya. Uh, I have another thought that just came up that I'm, I'm maybe jumping far too ahead, but how does this reflect on the, on the financial side of the business, you know? This is very much culture now, but then how would a shareholder or somebody who's responsible financially for that situation explain that act that took place of kindness or shared responsibility, but does it reflect in my financials? And how do I, how does it come across? And even if there's a long-term uh, return on that, uh, but for the immediate, I, I would find that very challenging to explain to my superiors. Okay, so really quite can interesting. I, sorry, can I, you want can to I, say? Sorry, can I just build on what Anya and uh, yeah. said, just very short. Um, what I also found um, is that they did not focus on the mistake. They focused on the, the the situation understanding uh, or or who they didn't ask who made the mistakes but they focused on the why the mistake happened in order to solve it and when it comes to whatever said i don't think anybody financially <clears throat> is in in organizations where are focused on the finance side of things. I don't think that they are very aware of the cost of not being a learning organization financially. <laughs> Thank you, Maria. Well, You've said something. Well, sorry. Andrea. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to, to add that also because if uh, we don't take this decision of reviewing and don't blaming, it will happen again. So even if the cost of the mistake is, is important, we need to solve it. So the, the idea is to see why it's happening, because if, if we don't correct that, it will happen again and the problem persists in, in, in time. Okay. Thank you very much for all your contributions. And I'm now going to go forward. Um, one of the things I wanted to raise very quickly is, uh, Maria in particular, you raised this is about the causes of cost. Uh, you've all, several of you have talked about cost, but this is about the causes of cost. And some of you mentioned this is the Japanese culture. Well, in fact, it, it wasn't. It's not the Japanese culture. Japanese culture is is to is is similar to ours in that sense. In fact, it's stronger about blame and and personal embarrassment and all of that. Um, this is focusing around what is what they call the system. So what they do is they blame the system, not the person. And what needs to happen for that to exist? That's what we're going to be talking about. One of the things that needs to happen is that when someone sticks their hand up, someone doesn't shout at them. Someone doesn't blame them. So you brought up the word blame, and that's an important part of this. So if we actually go and look at some of the quotes from Toyota. So if, if you read these yourself. Okay, so 
that's interesting they go there to think and the question that I have at this point is so who's who's responsible for that problem and you could hear from uh, from the feedback that actually it was the manager that said this is our problem not yours another quote this one I really like So there are really deep messages behind some of these quotes. So for me, this one is this is about people. This is actually we work with people like that example. That is an example of working with a person in a different way to what they were expecting. Now, Mr. Yoshino, from that moment onward, completely changed his approach of working within Toyota. Something changed fundamentally within him after that day. So this is about um, developing as part of, this is the way that we are in Toyota. So it's become part of the culture and uh, I'm just going to skip to another video. So I want to show you an example of what actually happens within Toyota in terms of the way that they work. And this is a short little clip. Toyota have tried to Kaizen every single part of their production system, looking for ways to make it as efficient as possible. Take these ingenious machines. They deliver windscreens to the line, so Toyota's workers don't waste time fetching and carrying them. Each has its own song, so you hear them coming. This one's called Dougal. Dougal is Dave's brainchild. This all looks a bit quite homemade, is it? Have you made these? We made it all made in house. That's the and my wiper motor of an event system. Oh, is it? Yeah. So that's what Dave did. Who's Dave? Dave is a frontline worker assembling the cars. He's not a specialist in making equipment. He is a frontline worker and every frontline worker is encouraged strongly to make things like that. And they get help from someone who knows how to do it. But they go, hang on a minute, I'm doing this thing. I think I can improve on it. These are frontline workers who in many other organizations are just employed to do a fixed task according to fixed instructions. And you don't deviate from that here this is very very different so this is something that other car plants other organizations don't do it's about changing the nature of the improvement of the work lies with the frontline worker so you have um so that's one element but what about the managers what are they doing so let's have a look at a video here about a manager in Toyota and let's figure out what they're doing. So we're going to stop this afterwards and we're going to talk about what are the key things that a manager is doing differently here to what you expect them to do. あの、だいぶ活動してくれて減ってるのはよくわかったんだけど。このシリンダーのやつはもう今は再現してないの。今はもうフィルター交換。もともとがフィルターのつまりで、あの、いろんなとこ調べてたんですけど、ま、オートス
なあの Z 軸、あの Z 軸方向のボールネジがあるんですけど、そこのイオンが非常に今、大きな問題になってまして、そのイオンがするということは、後々大きなあの長時間停止に関わるものですから、うんまあ、あのそれの対策をちょっとやってほしいんですが、うん、なかなかあの部品とかの調達等で、今、苦労してます。あ今いつ頃になってるのあこれはあの設備課さんからの,あの結果待ちですああじゃあ俺からもちょっとプッシュして、はい、できるだけ早くやってもらえるように話してます、はい、お願いします、はいはい、じゃあここにじゃあちょっと悪いけど、はい、これとこれ現地も囲みさせてくれるあはいはいここのあの扉のシリンダーの動作不良でスイングは。Okay, that's enough of that.、Um, what I'd like you to do is put in the chat some of the things that you saw that manager do. So that,、uh, okay, by Lavinia.、Um, what did the manager do that was promoting learning and maybe different to the experiences that you've had? In your organization. So I've written a few things down and I'd like to share them with you, but I'd like you to see what some of the things that you saw. So put them in the chat.、Um, and of course, relate this to a service organization. You're not in manufacturing, I don't think. Relate it to a service organization. So exactly the same thing will happen in a service organization. What did you see?、Um, and I'm going to come up with the list that I made. Um, so, first thing that I saw is the manager is there to learn. The manager praises people even though there is a problem. So, these are two people things. And yes, they're trying to understand the root cause of the problem. That's important.、Um, They, the manager has gone to the shop floor to look for these problems. The workers haven't gone to the manager in their office, or they haven't typed it on a computer system or sent it as an email. It's a physical, let's get together type thing. The manager is asking the workers, even though the manager might know the answer to some of these things. The manager is there to support. He's saying, What else do you need my help with? And the workers have the responsibility to identify those things and bring them up, and if they can, fix them themselves. The manager is writing in supportive comments into the board that's on the shop floor. The board is on the shop floor. It is not in an email attachment. It is not in a set of reports. It is on a physical space within the organization themselves. So, if anyone wants to know, they go to that board. And that board is not in the manager's office or in a manager's corridor. And the manager takes on full responsibility to prioritize and tell maintenance that this is going to, that they want this speeded up. So, it's a one visible place. For open communication that everybody can see. And it is about problem solving. It is a social activity, as, as you're saying. That's really interesting. And、um, yes, Judith, he's encouraging workers to solve the problems. And it's through observation, empathy, and personal presence. Absolutely. Those are key 
to working as a manager in Toyota. So within a service organization doing change, um, these are examples of exactly the same thing where you've got a small team. Uh, hang on a sec. Oh, I'm <laughs> going to just click the sharing button. There we go. And can you see that? Yeah. Okay. So that's a typical type of thing in a room where we're doing change. You've got things on the wall, all different things on the wall. And the bottom of that is a flow. What happened with the change team when we were doing that is firstly, they could show anybody that came into the room. This is what we're doing. And secondly, that flow would change almost every day as someone go, you know what, I, I'm not sure. I think we can improve on this. I think I can move that there or I can change this to another type of post-it. So this was all very physical rather than being hidden away on digital. I'm doing some work at the moment where and because I'm doing it virtually, this is hidden away virtually. No one's looking at it, right? And it's really funny uh, how that actually happens, how sometimes the the physical presence of having that around and what we're doing is we're helping frontline teams to measure what's going on so this is the type of measure that would be on that board it, again it's not in a manager's report it's on the board and people put comments like you can see there about what are the reasons for why this is not working and all of those reasons is to do with the system as opposed to it was him, he did it wrong, okay? So these are all things that help to, to develop an environment where learning can take place. So that's what this is about. And if, I, if, someone, had to, if, if someone said to me, okay, well, the, the first thing is, this is a different way of thinking. And if you think this is Japanese, well, it happens all across the world. So this is just one example of a, of a place where it happens. Uh, Toyota is now bigger than Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler put together. <laughs> okay, they're bigger than all three of them added up. The quality of their cars beats all of those three, and they're not expensive cars. They are cars which are just reliable. So these are some of the core principles that underlie the thinking of the senior management. So the focus of the design is instead of imposing a standard service, you apply and adapt variable services. So different Toyota organizations in different countries will do things slightly differently. They're not standardized. The, the manager's focus in a tr more traditional organization is what are my staff doing? The focus in Toyota is I'm not going to worry about what my staff are doing. I'm going to worry about are they creating value for the customer? Are they focused on the right thing? And creating value for the customer is based around let's get rid of waste, what they call waste in the system, non-value added activities. So that's what they really try and work on. The staff in a command and control organization basically follow procedures, follow rules in a book, and they, they do what they're told the staff in this type of organization will focus on what matters, which is focus on what matters to the customer, what matters to the value that we're, we're creating. Oh, one in interesting thing, they developed something called a, a cord, uh, and on cord. If there's a problem in the production line, they pull a cord and it stops the production line. And then a little team forms and they try and figure out the problem to solve it. That, doesn't happen in any other manufacturing plant. The perspective in an organization, command and control organization is normally top down. The perspective in this type of organization is outside in from the customer inwards. So it's not about the shareholders. It's not about what they want. It's not about what the senior managers want. That's a fundamental difference. The control in a traditional organization is with managers. The control here is that there is no one central place for control. It's on the shop floor. That's where it happens. The manager's role in a command and control organization is we ensure staff comply to the procedures. The manager's role in this organization is to support and develop staff. 
and the motivation comes from well i just do a job to i create things um so motivation is an outcome and because people are motivated they want to do a good job okay so i'm going to uh stop now and just i'm just looking to see if there's anything else that might be of interest um i'm going to stop now and ask you to uh express your interest in improvement in your organization in terms of what have you tried what is different to what you've seen here what are some of the fundamental things that you could take from here perhaps to your own work um and do you see now why this is so difficult do you see why Senge had such a problem this isn't straightforward how, how can you make some of that happen in the organizations that you're familiar with so please just uh, unmute yourself and um talk Just reading some um, comments um, about the virtual part and the physical part. Um, virtually, it is a bigger challenge to cr create connections among the teams. That's from Sarah Oliver. Um, if you want to add anything. Um, oh, yes, no worries. Um, and also from Chu. Problem solving is a social activity done between people and together, mm. which is also very important. So describing the fact that you to focus on people, that's some of what you said, Anya, is, is encapsulating that. This is really about focusing on people. The level of automation. So if you go into a manufacturing plant, especially cars, you'll see lots of robots and automation equipment. In Toyota, you will see minimum, minimal robots, minimal, minimal automation. The only automation you'll see is like that funny little trolley that frontline staff have created. They're not high-tech things. It's not a digital environment. Um, so that's a fascinating, I think that's a very fascinating aspect is that truly focusing on people mean that you leverage that and they find that that's more cost effective than it is to bring in automation which is very expensive and need experts to program and to control so have any of you tried to do any type of improvement in your organization and what have you tried to do how successful has it been sarah who can't unmute yourself so you've written something down there so I'll read it out for everyone. Um, in our organization, we have a systems approach, but we have a big problem with documentation and working with other third parties working for the same client. So trying to balance three different working cultures with a big flow of people. That's, uh, that's interesting because, and this is what Toyota have done. They don't make cars, they make parts of cars another organization makes parts like seats and windscreens and those things and they have to then be supplied to toyota so effectively they're almost stakeholders they're they're other parts of the system that are not your organization what do you do with them and sarah you're you're highlighting that really well we don't have control of them we can't tell them what to do so what toyota and others have done is that they've sent their engineers to those organizations and they work together with them. So if you go to some of the suppliers of Toyota, you'll find employees from Toyota in those organizations. And the only way you can tell them apart is because they have a slightly different overalls on. Apart from that, they're working together to try and solve the problems together. In Ford, uh, Ford will beat their suppliers around the head with a big stick and every year they insist on having improvements and cost cutting and they basically just shout at them and tell them this is what we want you to do go off and do it so it's a very different working relationship toyota and ford operate in almost opposite things if you go and work for ford you're not going to have nearly the same experience as you work for toyota it's quite a miserable 
and frustrating place to work. And you're just treated as a cog in a machine, by the way. Anything else? Anybody, any other challenges that anyone else um, is going to have? Claire? Just following on from, oh, sorry, I can see Lavinia's put a hand up and I wasn't so polite. Claire, you go ahead. I was go just going to, yeah, Lavinia, you go next. Oh, should no, I go? Go, go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to briefly comment on your, because it was me, your Ford comment was then making me think of what I had in my head as one of the big challenges, which is the financial focus. And so whether it's on, you know, a, a drive to um, generate income or whether there's a big cost pressure like austerity in local authorities in the UK or something like that, then then becoming a learning organisation, even though... Some of us might realize that that would be more helpful. Actually, the pressure that senior managers might face because of those financial constraints, it might be seen as more of a luxury and that it takes too much time and just get on with things and why you're reflecting on it and why you're trying to problem solve and why you're trying to collaborate and gain opinion because you just need to get on because we've got, you know, these deadlines and, and financial pressures that are then kind of stymie it. That's a very good question. And it's not, these aren't easy things to solve. So what I've done with County Council when I was doing a piece of significant piece of work in health and social care, which is very complex, nothing like manufacturing cars where you could actually measure the cost much easier. So what we did there is we insisted that the finance director come up from one end of the county to the other. This really annoyed the finance director. She was a very busy person. And why did she need to come up? Why couldn't we just send her a report? But we insisted about two months later, she turned up and one of the junior most people in the team, a physiotherapist or, or a nurse was taking her around and saying, well, at this point, we decided that it was most cost effective to do this. And the finance director was very interested. OK, that's interesting. Yeah. Mm, oh, that's really clever. So how are you working that out? And you say, well, we're not focusing on the cost. We're focusing on the causes of cost. Now, this was the first time the finance director had ever heard that phrase, ever in her whole career. She worked in the public sector many years and she was bowled over by the fact that that's actually what we should be doing. We should be focusing on the causes of cost that drive cost, not the cost. When you focus on cost, you actually drive cost up. So. We were able to demonstrate that in the team and with the findings that we had around the room. It took some time and it took some work to get that out up on the walls. But when we did and we could show those senior leaders that, that was actually the really helpful thing that we were able to do. So it's about being more intelligent about response, intelligent, I'm not saying we're more intelligent, but an intelligent response to those questions that senior managers have. It's not about answering their questions directly. It's about demonstrating to them what's behind the question that they're asking. What's the systemic challenges? Some of you may be aware of the iceberg model. That's a very useful concept to take people away from the surface and try and look beyond what's going on beyond the actual surface itself. Who else wants to go? Yeah, Judith, you're talking about double loop and triple loop learning. Exactly. So these are all things you can learn about within SI. What's the model? Uh, I, sorry, sorry, you've asked what's the model? Uh, I don't understand the question. I think Lavinia um, was next. Ah, I spoke oh, model. Just, just quickly, sorry. Uh, I think I'm just, just curious about... Uh, about thinking about different types of organizations. And I actually just, you know, work within a university context and it's an organization that sits between research and, and implementation. Uh, so it's almost at the edge of a university spectrum, but uh, just interesting to see how we, uh, how we try and do this or do what we do in an already existing system and, and where to start then, you know, and I wonder whether creating an actual physical space in which people are invited to come together might be i just i just wonder where we start in a system that already exists <laughs> and i have that question to ask at the, at the very end to make sure where's a good place to start and of course 
we don't all work with Toyotas and people that really want to do this. So that's a very good question. And where I suggest you start is somewhere where you think there is already a manager that I don't know what position you're in, but already a, man, a senior manager or an operational manager who already is wanting to think in that direction. Don't start with someone who you think, ooh, they're, they're not going to want this. Uh, so start off somewhere where you think you can make gains and look for those things that you think are a little bit obvious to you, but maybe not to them that you could perhaps work on and find out about and then go to them to go, look, I've just, I've had a look at this and we're spending a lot of time messing around on something that isn't really adding any value to anybody. Why are we doing this? Why are we recording all this information when no one actually reads it? So that's a really common one in the public sector. Why do we record all this stuff when no one actually goes back and reads it? Oh, well, the answer normally is, well, just in case. Okay, can we predict which one of these cases might actually end up in court? And actually, when you ask that question, I says, yeah, these aren't going to, but this one might. Why don't we start recording the details on this one, but not on those? Um, another one might be we're getting a lot of costs because we're not working together with another department. So can I have permission to work with a couple of people, one from each department, and see if we can streamline the work between the departments? In the public sector in particular, it's very often the, the clashes between departments or the time delays between departments that is causing the delays are causing the cost uh, redesigns and all that kind of thing you have to reevaluate stuff so um, try to look for those things where you can start from and once you've done that you can develop a bit of traction to perhaps work on those wider and wider things and of course the second advice i would give is work together with people in the work don't do this disconnected from them and bring them together in the same room and have conversations. They normally know already what things need to change. It's the manager who doesn't know. So that's, that's some of my thoughts on this. Uh, any other questions? Yes, yeah, start with ourselves, but don't start alone. That's a good, that's a good one, Anya. Um, who shares the same values as yourself who's open-minded uh sometimes who are the key stakeholders it, it depends on where you start um be curious yes very good um and it's fine if you're curious but if you're working with the manager the manager's the one that's going to say yes or no whether they like this or not whether it's going to go forward so it has to fit into where they are and it might be that you can't change where they are and how they think at the moment, but you can start to make inroads into that and start to see if they're curious that you can start to help them. Um, a matter of um, fostering a curious culture within an organization. And it takes time, but it's possible to hmm. start asking questions and not questions that sound like you're against people or against an idea, but kind of ask, create a culture for people to ask questions. And could I ask, um, in terms of this session, which we're coming to a close in about four minutes, is there something that you would like to have seen about the session that you haven't seen? And are there, is there anything that you can think of now that you would like to have as another session in the future that might take this forward? So those two questions are, what could we have done differently or what could we add? And secondly, what could we do next that might help develop this within the organization's hub in SI? So just write those down in the chat, please, while you think about something else that you might want to sort of wrap up with in terms of taking learning forward. Because I guess moving on from Senga's learning organization is that there are many tools and techniques out there. And I find that those tools and techniques are not helpful unless you attach them to the people side of things in terms of motivation, in terms of helping managers to see that these are helpful. So I find that learning methods and techniques are more about involving people and social side rather than 
the technical side. Now you can learn about these things within SI, about some of those methods like the iceberg model and several different things that can help you. There are processes, problem solving things and all of that, but those in themselves and Senge's book in itself is not going to create a learning organization. So those are kind of the last type of like the last phrase that is part of this thing. Any other points anyone wants to bring up? First of all, thank you, John, for your great presentation. We learned a lot, I feel. Okay, thank you. Um, any comments from people you want to put in the chat about what could have, what extra could have done, or what are the next steps? Or unmute yourself and just tell me if you can. So, Implicit learning, yeah. Yeah, Judith wrote. I think the big challenge is about implicit learning, also how to convince people why learning is important. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. So, uh, for example, I, I come from a manufacturing background uh, in the northeastern region of India, which is again, just culturally very hierarchical. And this concept of where I'm your friend as a senior, and it, and uh, that you can be frank with me and we can open up and be like open to each other uh, seems to be quite a challenge. But then since this was an example also from Japan, where again, things are quite hierarchical in the sense of how society stands, I, I do see a hope that, you know, if one manager does it, you can create a like a, a bubble of a, like a bubble within a culture, pretty much. That's what I take as a brighter side of this. Yes, and that actually happens in some organizations. It happens in the EU as well. Sometimes groups develop something and it gets larger and people get interested and that becomes a focus for part of the EU administration. That's that's interesting. Um, but there are some char characteristics of managers that need that they need to have to make this happen. And one of them is not to be too arrogant and not to have so much of an ego. So um, um, sorry, Sarah, you've just said something there. Um, uh, yeah, I can read it out. Um, so the parts that Sarah heard are reinforcing um, Sarah's thoughts on how important the human factor is, how safe they feel to approach people, knowing the right stakeholders, feeling comfortable within the culture. Maybe they were shared at, uh, maybe these thoughts were shared at the beginning, but those are Sarah's thoughts. Excellent. Psychological safety. Remo the removal of fear is the step number one. If you don't have that, I mean, it doesn't remove all its, itself all at once, but working on that, if that doesn't happen, you're not going to get people sticking their hand up. And um, Chu also wrote, it's a huge cultural change. How is it how to make this style of organizational learning go big and broad? That's yes. Chu's question. Start small and simple before you go big and broad. Oh dear. Okay, well, um, are there any more questions? It is time now. Practical approaches, scenarios in which we tackle different types of systems. And share good examples or good case studies. Thank you. It's been great. And uh, I hope it was a value to for you to spend an hour here. Thank you very much. Thank you very, Thank much. You very much, John.